I just encourage people, you know, to make that leap to, to go off the cliff or over the wall, whatever, however you want to think about it. But it's really exciting, you know, being in charge of your own destiny and being able to have the impact that you want to have every day. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob Castillo, and welcome to another episode of Over the Wall. Today, I've got Leah Sullivan on, who is the founder of TaskRabbit. And we've all used the service before. Uh, she did amazing things uh, with that company over 10 years and sold it to Ikea, and now is a venture capitalist. And uh, just really happy to have her on the show to talk about you know, what it took to build a company. Now she's in venture investing, so she's on the other side. You know, helping entrepreneurs sort of fulfill their purpose and dreams. So, uh, with that, Leah, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Rob. I'm excited to be here. So, you know, I, I kind of wanted to start. I, I looked at a couple of your interviews online, and and you talked about like 2008 and the financial crisis, and that drove a lot of people out of work, and that opened up this huge opportunity. And I kind of wanted to relate it a little bit to. Obviously, we just went through another macro yeah. environmental impact on us, and maybe there's a way to tie it together, but you, you saw this massive change in the world and somehow you connected dots on it to, to creating a company. And I just want to kind of start there if we could. Yeah, absolutely. I've actually been thinking a lot about that over the course of the last year. So, you know, I was at IBM at the time where I had the idea for TaskRabbit and I ended up leaving IBM in about June of 2008. It was September of 2008 that the stock market crashed and everyone was being laid off. Um, and it turned out to be the best time to start a company like TaskRabbit. Although I wish I could say I had really strategically timed it you know, perfectly, but people were out of work and they were looking for new flexible ways of finding work. Um, when I think about what we've all just been through with the pandemic over the last 18 months, you know, certainly 2020, I think we'll look back on as a year where there were new companies and new innovations that were spawned. I, I really believe that in times of crisis, in times where the world is changing, customer behavior is shifting, people's expect expectations are different um, about life, that's when innovation happens. And that's when you can really, I think, capture uh, new customers and capture new ideas and go out and build them. So with Fuel Capital, the uh, seed fund that I run now with my partner, Chris Howard, I mean, we have been overwhelmed with companies starting in the last 12 to 18 months. And so I think we'll see a lot, you know, as we look back on this time, we'll see a lot of these new, big, important, iconic companies will have formed in 2020. Where do you think they'll come from? I mean, not come from or industries or I guess yeah. what's the change you're seeing? Because once again, you saw something when you started, there was a there was like this, and also Uber came out of that time frame and yeah. Airbnb, and yeah. it's like the this whole idea of like working on your own. Yes. Um uh, the gig economy is that got termed. What's the economy you think is being created through this? Well, you know, I think that we'll, of course, have clarity on this right in the next like year or two, maybe three years, because we'll look back and we'll say that was, you know, we looked back in 2014 and said that was the sharing economy. That was the gig economy, right? We're still in it a little bit. But what I'm seeing are major shifts in healthcare tech, uh, major shifts in the future of work, as you can imagine. Um, yeah you know, people working in these hybrid, remote, virtual settings, um, real shifts around hiring. Um, we just did an investment in a company that is focused on um, how to make the hiring process a better experience for everyone and for companies. Um, and so those are kind of three kind of core areas that we've, you know, seen obvious shifts in. Um, you know, also, I mean, consumer behavior in general as well, like what people are buying, how much money they're spending. Um, you know, the restaurant industry has been tipped upside down on its head. I mean, it's just innovation, honestly, everywhere you look right now. Yeah, I, I had um, Anthony Dorio on the uh, program, and he's one of the founders of Ethereum. And we were talking about, uh, you know, DAOs, distributed organizations, and a lot of the blockchain companies, yeah. they have this new model where, you know, you're not working for a company, you're working on open source projects, but the, the they put the, um, 
obviously the reward, the coin, the token is in the work. Yeah. And it just seems like there's something there that's that may be our future. I don't know if you've looked at it or thought through it. Well, we, we actually also just did an investment in a company that's um, creating one of the first cryptocurrency and cash banks. Um, so we're certainly seeing, you know, some innovation and in cryptocurrency becoming more mainstream. And, you know, what you describe is having these, you know, cryptocurrency financial models, you know, come into work as well and and how we work and how we're paid for work and how we structure it. I mean, the future of work. So yes, to, to all of that. Cause it feels like there's a bunch of people on the sideline right now who are just considering what to do. They're not going back to work. That's and, right. And I think employers are afraid to say, Oh, you've got to come back to the office. Right. And so there's this, there's something going on that feels like there's a negotiation mentally yeah. between the old and the new. And it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see where it kind of falls out. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting to see specifically where it falls out for women and for, for families. I mean, I think women have been hit really, really hard when you think about work and in the pandemic. You know, the the vast majority, when you look at the numbers of those who were laid off, unemployed, or have left work, have been women. Yeah. Um, you know, and gosh, like, I understand this, just trying to get, you know, kids homeschooled and you know, without any any help or childcare options, um, everything was just shut down. You know, that's an area too. When I look at how how is the customer changing, it's like, okay, women are you know in charge of the the purse strings and the budgets usually in households, and like how is their mind shift? How is their mind shifting? Their mindset shifting, and you know, what are they focused on and, and buying and, and how are they thinking about going back to work as well? It's interesting. I, it's, uh, you know, we, we talked about on the show with a couple of guests about, you know, a lot of women are out of, out of the workplace now and, and yet they, they want to work. So right. it seems like, is that, is that, is that the nucleus of the change now that'll happen? It'll be interesting. I don't know. What, what do you think? I mean, that group seems like they, they obviously are challenged with kids being at home and, and they're schooled at home and all that. But I feel like they they got to make, there's going to be a play in there somewhere with them. There will be. I mean, we've seen a lot of tech too around families, family tech, and like just how do you use technology to um, you know, support and enable and automate a household and so much of the overhead of, of running a household and, you know, um, taking care of children and homeschooling, all these, there's so much overhead involved, just like basic things like, you know, getting food and groceries and, you know, whatever else it is. And so we've seen a lot of tech too around just home automation for the family. I think that's another area, like all this technology does enable us to live more efficiently and to be more efficient. And so if, if, if we're able to do that, what opportunity does that open up? Um, if we have less of that overhead to manually manage ourselves. So you are, you know, when you started the company in, in 08, in the financial crisis, you had to become an entrepreneur and spread your wings, right? And you had to take the first leap. And we talk about that as like the first wall, just obviously shows called over the wall. You, you had to make some mental leap. And so what was that? Do you remember that time or what happened? You know, obviously there's the story of why you started TaskRabbit, but that time we were like, I'm just going to go for it. Was yeah. it like instant or was it, you know, people yeah. have the entrepreneurs just wake up, I'm going to go for it. I'm giving up my life. I'm going for it. And it's usually not the case. Yeah. It felt more like a cliff than a wall for me. <laughs> it was like, over the cliff. <laughs> yeah. Over the cliff. You might want to rebrand. I don't know. Um, but yet it didn't feel like there, I, I didn't know what was below me and I didn't know if it was safe or not. I, I didn't, you know, like I didn't know if this was a good choice, but I was really, really passionate about this idea I had for TaskRabbit for this company. And I remember, you know, as a programmer at IBM, I had a very stable, very lovely job, um, which I actually enjoyed. I enjoyed it a lot. But I just could not shake this idea. I just could not shake this feeling that the idea I had should exist. I knew I could build it. So why wasn't I doing that? And there was a moment where, you know, I had kind of like 
gone back and forth and should I just stay at IBM? I could work on this on the side or should I just really go for it? And, you know, there's so many reasons not to go for it. There's so many things that I didn't know how to do. There was, I'd never talked to investors before. I didn't really understand anything about raising money for a company. Um, but I think I decided, I remember like a, a light switch went on and I thought, you know what? None of this is rocket science. I'll be able to figure it out. Like, I'm just going to go figure it out. And once I decided that I was smart enough to figure it out as I, as I went, and I didn't need to know everything before I made that leap, um, then I just, I just never looked back after that. We often talk about entrepreneurs like, do you believe they're kind of born or you're kind of made? And then I didn't ask about your family background. Like, did you have a reference point of entrepreneurism in your family? I didn't. And so that's a tough question for me. I'm, I'm thinking about it as I'm answering. And, you know, my mom was a stay at home mom. My dad was in the Air Force for 35 years. Um, I grew up in very rural part of Massachusetts. The population of the town I grew up in was 4,000 people. So no, there was zero point of reference. I think um, for some reason though, I remember when I was eight years old, I asked my dad what the highest job position is in a company. And he told me it was being a CEO. And I remember I then created my first company, which I called Pollution Solutions. And it was basically a recycling program I created for my school. And I made myself the CEO and I made my sister, you know, a VP. I made my cousin, I don't know, the janitor or something. <laughs> <laughs> Set up offices in our basement. And I was really into it. And so I don't know, maybe, maybe that story does then dictate that it was more of being born than being nurtured because I'm not sure I, I had an example or a point of reference to follow. Um, but I think I always had sort of the drive and motivation to create, to innovate. And, and what really motivates me and what motivates me with fuel as well is the ability to have an impact on other people. Like I really enjoy being able to create something, um, you know, get it launched and then, and then see how it impacts other people. And so to get to invest in entrepreneurs with fuel is just like an expedited way of doing it, you know, times a hundred instead of just times one company. And you talk about, I, I guess you, and I was reading about um, not hogging your idea. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs, I meet them too and they're like, Oh my God, I, I don't want to tell you, sign a non-disclosure and nobody can know my idea. And every, I always get the non-disclosure. I'm like, look, most people don't have enough time to do their own ideas, let alone your idea. Right. And you talk about sharing it and and, the, and and why that's important. And maybe you could take us through that because once again, entrepreneurs tend to be like, everyone wants to steal my idea, but there's something else out there. I think you, you've talked about. Yeah. I mean, um, so one, I was not the first person to have the idea for TaskRabbit. You're Sorry. kidding. Like you copied it. Did you copy it or did you did you see it before and make it better? Or no. was there a bunch of people at the same time out when you were out? No, I mean like the idea of borrowing a cup of sugar from a neighbor or like getting the high school kid down the street to mow the lawn or like whatever it is, like this this idea of neighbor help neighbors helping neighbors or utilizing other people to do things you can't do, like that's not a new concept, right? That's not a new idea. Yeah. And people would come up to me all the time, you know, after I would speak on stage or something, they would come up to me and be like, oh, I had this idea for TaskRabbit, you know, five years ago. And I was like, cool, like, what did you do with that idea? Like, the point is, is like, there are so many ideas and there's so many ideas that are actually quite obvious. But if you don't build them, it, it's it's really in the execution and the operations and bringing an idea to life and bringing it to a market um, that makes it into a business. And so my philosophy was always, if I could share my idea with anyone who wanted to listen to me, this idea I had for TaskRabbit, it could have been a mom at the coffee shop, it could have been a random stranger on the bus next to me, I would talk to everyone I could about this idea. Because everyone I talked to had great feedback for me about it, uh, told me, you know, the five things that they would use it for, what their concerns would be, why wouldn't they use it? 
And then I was able to build something actually that worked and that people wanted. Um, and so I think being able to get feedback for your ideas before they're even off the ground um, is so much more valuable than, you know, holding the idea too close, thinking that someone's going to steal it because you know what? Okay. They could steal it, but then what are they going to do with it? Are they really going to go build it before you do? Exactly. And I, such, I had Mark Randolph. He's one of the co-founders of Netflix with Reed Hastings. And he, he's talked so much about this idea. He said, all ideas are bad. You know, like as in it's just an idea and you have to make it. And he talked about like if you want to do something, just get a make a unit of one. You don't have to go build a giant technology platform. Like just try to like so want someone to rent your clothing example. He gave it then let them rent your clothing in your home and see if somebody yeah. actually will do it. But what was the early I guess I'll ask you what happened at TaskRabbit to give you a feedback loop that, hey, this was this we're on to something here versus that then what it became. What right. The first step in. I mean, I was the first task rabbit. <laughs> I mean, that was that was easy. I, I was the task rabbit. Um, so I, I built the site and I got it launched with a small group of um, of moms that lived in one square mile of Boston, the Charlestown Mothers Organization. And I thought moms are busy. I wasn't even a mom at the time, but moms are busy. They probably have things they need to do and outsource. And then... Um, you know, I recruited on Craigslist at the time, the first 30 taskers to start the site, but I was also a tasker. I had this little metropolitan Honda metropolitan scooter. I used to just scoot around Boston and just run errands and run tasks for people. And that was the feedback loop. I mean, it was like real interactions with people, um, you know, what their expectations were, what pricing was, what their concerns were, all of those things I felt firsthand. I mean, I remember in the very early days when the site was first launched, you know, I'd get an alert every time a text was posted and I'd be like, oh my God, there's another you know, task posted. I would watch and I'd wait and I was like, okay, hey, who's going to pick it up? And if it wasn't picked up by one of the other taskers within, you know, five minutes, I would go do it myself. Um, funny story. We actually had this really, really highly engaged tasker in the Boston area. He's this young guy, probably in his like 20s, had just gotten out of college. And he just was pure hustle, like, just wanted to make money, was willing to like run around and do whatever was needed. And in the code, in the algorithm, the very first version, every time a task was posted, we would alert, you know, all 30 taskers. Well, this guy, I remember his name was Anj. He would pick up every single job, okay? Literally within like a half a second. Like he just would like refresh, pick up, refresh, pick up everything. And he'd do them all and he'd do them all to perfection. But he would really piss off all the other taskers who wanted to actually get jobs too. <laughs> and so we hadn't quite figured out like, yet how to you know stagger alerts or maybe alert based on geography or categories you know, like all of that was way too fancy than what we had built you know for to yeah. your point like this very what strong you have a, this is just a listing where people would just post up and anyone can grab it there's no routing or yeah. Anything like that. yeah so we put in the code we put in the code if the tasker equals on delay like 90 seconds just to give someone else a chance and so, it, you know, just like funny stories like that and learning in real time how to manage a marketplace and, and on both sides, right? What taskers needed and what clients needed and how to make those matches. Was there a, a situation, there's, there's the on one with, with this guy, but was there any times where you thought, man, this is not going to work, even though it was working, right? You got it up, but you're like, this won't scale or boy, we're in trouble. Have you ever had, did you ever have one of those moments? I'm like all the time, all the time, all the time. Still, I mean, like still haunts me to this day, all the things that happened. I mean, whether it was being close to running out of money, not being able to raise money, uh, things that went wrong, tasks that went wrong on the site, um, you know, all kinds of things happened all the time. And um, those are tough moments. Uh, I remember early on, you know, this was still when, I had left IBM, I had got the site launched, but I hadn't raised any money yet. I had sort of given myself six months to make something happen because I couldn't be jobless forever. 
Um, and I was pitching investors, pitching investors. This is the end of 2008 now. I remember the, over the holidays of 2008, I was still talking to investors like in Boston. No one was really interested. No one was really biting. And it took until March of 2009. So it took a full nine months before I found my first angel investors in the Boston area. And between that, those holidays, 2008 and March of 2009, those three months, I remember every day just saying like, Ugh, maybe I should just go back to IBM. Like, yeah, it's working, but like, can I really do this? Is this really viable was the question at that point. Um, but I'm glad I stuck it out uh, because I did find those angel investors. And then from there, I ended up coming out to the Bay Area and uh, participating in an incubator program that got me connected with a whole bunch of other West Coast investors. And then it really snowballed. But you write about how when you're raising money, you kind of you got sick, I guess, from the stress and you ended up in the hospital. So, yeah. I mean, obviously, I, I raised the same thing, a lot of money in the early days. And now we're public, so it's different. But. Yeah. Um, I, every founder goes through it. Every, every, you know, goes through this money raise. Most of them, I guess I'll ask you two questions. One is what, when do you think it's a good time to raise money? Cause a lot of times we're like, I just want to raise money. And, and then if you're going to raise it, like, is there a strategy out there to do it in a way that doesn't end you up sick, you know, mm -hmm. that you can do it. So, so if you could create, you know, what's, what, what do you think of those, what do you think of those two, uh, answer those questions? So lots, lots of ideas there. So one, I think my experience raising money is I raised a lot of money and then I didn't raise any money for three or four years because we had raised so much money. And then when I went back out to raise money after three or four years, the market was totally different. We were now like this older company. We weren't like the shiny new, you know, hot startup coming out of YC or wherever. And so it was that actually was the hardest round for me to raise was like the tiny little round I needed to get us to profitability um, right at the end. So if I could do it all over again, I would have been much more strategic about how I paced our raises. I wouldn't have stayed out of market for those three or four years. I would have you know, kept a steady drumbeat. I would have raised more money in that series C round. Um, I raised $10 million after I just had raised $18 million. I probably could have brought in more, but I was tired. And I was like, oh, we, like, we have so much money. We do not need any more money right now. But guess what? Like, I probably should have raised more money then. Um, so, you know, I think that what I realize now, and particularly being on the investor side for venture, is that... Oh. Startups don't think about it this way. At least I didn't think about it this way. But you're really, sometimes you've got to operate your company with um, with the strategy of what is going to get me to the next raise instead of what is the best way to scale this company. Sometimes those things are the same, but sometimes they're different. And I'll give you an example. So, you know, with TaskRabbit, there was a lot of sort of back and forth with investors on how many markets we should be open in. Should we go deep in one or two markets? Should we open 20 markets? Why aren't we available everywhere? And um, it was interesting because at the time, the investors that had invested in the company really wanted to see us focus and go deep in the markets we're in. But I sort of had this inclination of like, okay, that's great. We can get profitable and grow the business in Boston and San Francisco in two markets. But then like, what's the pitch? What's the story for the next set of investors? And my internal investors are like, well, you're going to tell them you're going to, you have this playbook now and you're going to stamp out these markets. But I was so worried there's going to be like too many questions about like, well, you're only in two markets and we'd like to see you in more. And you know, the revenues aren't as high as what we'd like. Um, and it turned out, I, I decided to go ahead and just open five more cities. And as soon as I opened five more cities, we had all this inbound from investors. People wanted to invest at that moment. They saw that we could open more markets. And yeah, the operations and the revenue and the scale wasn't perfect in all of those five markets. But there was at least a footprint there yep. um, that was exciting and that was compelling and that we could work with. And so I think that's a good example of like, you know, if I lived in a vacuum and didn't need to raise more venture money, you know, would it have been okay to just stay in two cities and go really deep in those markets? Yes, it would have been okay. 
but I needed to raise more venture money. And so I had to think about what is going to be the compelling story here that I can tell. Um, and to do that, I had to open more cities more quickly. And so when you look for, um, you're on the other side of the table now and you're looking at investing in, um, you know, entrepreneurs. And I often talk about them being like self-aware. Like you have to be able to understand who you are and where you are. Like you were saying, you, when you went to open more markets, people got attracted to you more. But when you're on the other side of the table looking at, what do you look for? Like what tells you I'm investing? You know, what, yeah. what, do, you, what do you see in that person? Well, we really invest in the earliest stages. So we'll typically get involved when a company is raising their first institutional seed round. These days that can mean anywhere from three to $5 million. I mean, the seeds have started to grow. Um, we've seen that happen over the course of the last couple of years. We'll write in a million five, sometimes a $2 million check into these rounds. And so at that point, you're still really investing in the people, in the team and their idea. And what I really look for is a team that I feel like is purpose built for that particular opportunity. You know, they have a, a reason for focusing on this project more than, oh, I just wanted to start a business and I had this idea and I think the numbers work and the market's big enough. Like that's all well and good. And some that's how some people do start businesses, but I'm much more compelled by the entrepreneur that has that compelling founding story that is really purpose built for that opportunity. So that's really the first, the first thing that we look for and the thing that I think is most important. And you just have to make sure then that the market size is, you know, big enough and compelling enough. And then you really have to put your trust into that team, into those founders to to build and scale and, you know, and support them in their vision to do that. I often say that entrepreneurs have this, like, if you're truly doing it and you were doing it for 10 years and, and I'm now 25, but like, I feel like you're living a purpose. Like not that you're trying to make money from it, or you just feel like you're. It's a purpose-driven um, event in your life, and it's more than just a, a small portion of your life. It kind of engulfs you. I mean, is that is that what you're kind of looking for too? Do you see that there? This is their purpose. This is why I think this person's been put on earth. Absolutely, um, and, and typically they're building, you know, for themselves or for a customer that's really close to them, like. They, they really understand the pain points um, and the problems of what they're trying to solve. And, you know, for me, it was with TaskRabbit, I just couldn't shake the idea, right? Like it just, it stuck with me. And so just looking for people that have that same sort of drive um, and motivation to make an impact. So when you think about entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs, um, I mean, it, it still seems like a pretty, especially in tech, a pretty male dominated, white male dominated tech world. I mean, when you're funding entrepreneurs, I guess, is there a focus on that? Uh, why aren't there as many women entrepreneurs from your perspective? You know, what, what, what's sort of your sense? Um, so a few things. I mean, I think that, um, so one, the fuel capital portfolio is 40% female so, capital. That's great. And that's not even something that we focused on at all, like have had zero conversations about uh, that, you know, as a target, as a number, but our deal flow is different. Our sourcing is different. And so what that tells me is the people that are deploying capital, so venture capitalists, the GPs, um, you know, they may tend to invest in people that look like them or in problems that they understand or be drawn to companies that you know are in markets that they really are compelled by and so that has happened at fuel just naturally over time um when you think about the makeup of venture firms you know still the very vast vast majority of them you know are are men uh our male venture capitalists our male gps and so when you think about, okay, how do new firms get created or how do more women get into these types of roles like I'm in at Fuel? Um, because that's really what's going to move the numbers for entrepreneurs. Yeah. You know, you think about one of two things. Either women need to be joining these kind of old, stodgy, old school venture funds. Um, and some, some women have. Um, but even then it's going to take a long time to see numbers change because, 
you know, how many deals a year do these venture funds do? Maybe one, maybe two. Um, you know, how many boards does a single partner sit on in some of these later stage funds? It's like, you know, the, the numbers won't move quickly in that regard. I think the higher impact thing to do is actually to have newer funds formed, new venture funds that are formed by women, that are formed by people of color, um, and to be able to fund those firms to go out and find that next generation of entrepreneurs that look like them, that are, that are compelled by them. Um, and so to do that, you need limited partners, you need LPs that want to fund these new venture firms. And so, um, you know, one of the initiatives that I'm really excited to be involved in is a, a fund of funds called Screen Door. And it was actually started by 10 GPs, uh, all seed investors in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really the brainchild of the homebrew partners, Satya Patel and Hunter Walk, um, who brought together this group of 10 GPs. And, um, you know, we raised a $55 million fund to invest in the next stage of funds who are run by women and people of color. And so that's just a small example, right, of, of, you know, something I'm excited about and involved in where I think that can make an impact. But we really do need many more funds created. We need these big institutional investors to be able to fund and start, um, you know, these funds to be able to support, you know, a diverse set of, of founders. Yeah, you would think out of what happened with COVID and everything that um, and, and the focus on this, that this is where a lot of energy and, and would be on today, you know, that because there's a need out there. And and uh, and from a brand perspective, as a fund, you're going to have a great brand. You know, part of it is attracting the right entrepreneurs. They want to have the right, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of money out there. But if you're an entrepreneur, you may want to work with a fund that's diverse. That's about diversity, right? And, and that's the thing, too, is that the, the entrepreneurs, this next generation of entrepreneurs is very different in their thinking. And they do want to work with funds that are diverse, that have a group diverse of GPs um, and investors as well. And so, you know, it things are shifting. It's, it's a slow shift. It takes a lot of time. Um, it's really hard to move these numbers because they are so dismal. Um, but I think that there's massive opportunity and, you know, study after study shows that the returns on a venture fund that is led by a diverse set of partners are higher um, than it just run, you know, by an all male firm. And also the returns on investment on businesses that are run by a diverse founding team are higher um, than just a homogeneous team as well. Turning back to you again, I just I want to ask you a question that I ask everyone on the show, which is, um, do you have a voice in your head, a little voice in your head um, that at times you've got to beat, that you've got to silence, that you work hard to say, I'm not that type of person. And I, I said mine was, I, I think I'm young. I'm too young to do what I'm doing. I'm too inexperienced. We, do you have one of those voices? <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> what you're talking about no, i'm just kidding <laughs> i mean i don't know <laughs> i don't know you know um is there okay. something in your head that you like if you're i feel like most entrepreneurs have something they're trying to like it's this little tiny voice you're like i'm going to show the world i'm going to show myself that i can do this do you have something like that I think that my, so my thing, maybe the, yeah, maybe the, the similar thing that I have is I'm very affected by other people and the impact I'm having on other people. And so, you know, for instance, with TaskRabbit, it's like, like I said, all of these things would happen. Good things would happen. Bad things would happen. All kinds of things would happen on the site. And it was really uh, a roller coaster ride for me emotionally. Like I would live and die by every task that was posted and people's experiences. And, you know, you'd hear amazing stories about how, um, you know, a tasker is like saved money to take their family on vacation all by working on TaskRabbit. And you just are like, oh my God, that's so amazing. I just love that. But then the, like the next hour you'd hear a story about like an apartment that was flooded because the tasker did a bad job and, you know, like destroyed someone's home and you're like, oh my God, this is terrible. And so I think for me, um, 
I'm really driven by the opportunity to have that positive impact. And so I'm, I'm like constantly pushing myself and, and asking myself, like, is this big enough? Does this matter enough? Like, if I'm going to spend my time on something, it, it really has to matter. Otherwise, I just, I just don't care. Like, I just feel like, you know, um, everyone, everyone has their purpose. And I, I feel like my purpose is, 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 is doing things that I feel like do have an impact and do make a difference and do matter. And so anything else that like comes my way, I, I, I may say no to, or I may just kind of not be as excited about. Maybe that is, is similar to like the voice in my head because I'm constantly saying like, does this, does this really matter? And, and how much of an impact does it actually have? But did that drive any of your decision to sell the company to Ikea? Absolutely. I mean, I think the exciting thing about Ikea um, was that it was such a great opportunity for TaskRabbit to have that bigger impact globally a lot faster than just on our own, on our own platform by ourselves. You know, from day one, Ikea Furniture Assembly was actually one of the most popular tasks posted on TaskRabbit. So I, you know, like 10 years later, it did not necessarily surprise me that we ended up selling to Ikea. Um, but it was the opportunity to open new markets in different countries and to have a footprint that was already established. Yeah, that was really exciting and, and really compelling. And yeah, ultimately was a big part of, of the reason to sell. During the time when, before you sold, obviously you had kids. And I want to just you know touch upon that being a mom, an entrepreneur, all of that, all that stress. I mean, you know, how'd you do it? I mean, it's in, in three kids now, but uh, yeah. you know, how, how did you do that? Um, God, I mean, it's not easy. It's not easy for anyone. Um, it, it wasn't easy. I was pregnant with my first, with Amelia, when um, we had to we had to downsize the company we had to lay off like 30 percent of the team and i was so worried you know it was my first child my first pregnancy i was like under so much stress this was like my worst nightmare of having to downsize the team and i was like wow like if this you know to the extreme i mean if this kills my baby because i'm like so stressed out about having to do this like what am I gonna do um and I did you know the day that we did that layoff was terrible and it was terrible for you know mostly for the people that had to be laid off um but I did go to the hospital that afternoon because I didn't feel like I felt the baby kicking anymore and I was like so stressed out that wow. like I had done something wrong you know so um it's yeah it's it's not easy it's a lot I think you know, asking for help where you can, getting help where you can. I think over the years, what I've learned is you can have everything you want to have. You can have a family, you can have your business, you can have, you, you can have it all. You can have success, all these things. It's really hard to have them all at the same time. And so, you know, being open to kind of a sequence and sequencing things um, a bit or asking for help or outsourcing. I mean, like, thankfully, I created a, a platform where I could outsource a lot of stuff around the house. Um, that was very helpful. Um, so, you know, it's um, the old uh, the old adage, I guess, it takes a village. I mean, it really does. Um, but it's, um, it's been great. And now I have, I have three, as you said. Um, and I think Amelia... When I had her as running TaskRabbit, when I had Ryan, I was just transitioning to the board of TaskRabbit and we were selling the company. And now with CB, the little one, I'm full-time at Fuel. And um, it has been just a vast shift um, in my day-to-day. -day. And, you know, going from one to three children, going from startup CEO to investor, it's been a, it's been a scale. It's been a sliding scale. And so... You just figure out over time how to manage it all. But I think your husband's also an entrepreneur too, correct? <laughs> well, yeah. So my husband does run his own company as well. Um, and so, you know, it's nice actually having someone else that kind of knows, you know, what you're going through. I know what he's going through, certainly. Um, 
And we actually met, my husband and I met in YPO, Young Presidents Organization. Yep. And, you know, that's an organization for CEOs that run, you know, larger size companies. And the organization was created because a lot of CEOs just don't have that peer group or those people that they can go to and confide in and, and you know, bounce ideas off of. Um, and so it is kind of funny that Michael and I did meet in YPO because, you know, we're both stressed out CEOs. I've always had a coach also. I don't know if you've had a coach or not. Oh, yeah. yeah. Same thing. So like you get find, having someone to talk to, yeah. you don't always have to bring it home. That's so you have a support group, I think, is, is, is the key here, right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I usually like to ask a last question, which is if you could – actually, I'm going to change it up this time. What do you think of that? Great. Let's do it. If there's a question you would want to ask yourself if you were interviewed, something that nobody would know but you think could tell something really quite interesting of an idea about life – and being an entrepreneur, just life in general, what would the question be that you would want to ask yourself? I mean, I think it's like, what, what would you have done differently is always like the question um, that is so hard to answer. And I think, you know, there's lots of things that I would do differently, but if I had to pinpoint one thing, I would go back to my time in my 20s and I would have become an entrepreneur sooner. I was 28 when I left IBM and had the idea for TaskRabbit. I think I probably had another company in me before that. And so I just wish that I had, you know, made that leap faster, made it sooner. And maybe I could have totally failed, you know, but I would have learned a lot as well. Um, so yeah, I just encourage people you know, to make that leap to, to go off the cliff or over the wall, whatever, however you want to think about it. But, um, I think it's, it's really exciting, you know, being in charge of your own destiny and being able to have the impact that you want to have every day. So do you miss it? Um, I don't miss it. I don't miss it at all. Um, but what I do, um, I do love is getting to, you know, live these journeys alongside entrepreneurs now um, and to share my own experiences and to support and help where I can. Um, but I feel like TaskRabbit was my baby and that that time has passed. And so now I'm here to support that next generation of entrepreneurs and creating their their big businesses. Awesome. Well, Leah. Yeah. Thank you for being on the show. You're an awesome entrepreneur. I think it's great the way you're investing, you're supporting entrepreneurs because the stage, the early stage, like first round is the hardest one, right? It's like you're betting on someone, it's a gamble, but then you got to support them in a different way than if they're a couple of years yeah. in. So I just think yeah. it's like uh, entrepreneurial God's work that you're <laughs> doing over there and uh, appreciate everything that you've given back and all the successes that you have. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Rob.